Okay, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. This is Dr. Kaz, and I am going to try to wrap up the chapter 10 uh, muscle chapter. And we last left off talking about muscle fiber types, and I wanted to get into the continued classification of muscle fiber types. And we have three types of muscle uh, of skeletal muscle fiber types. Our first one listed here above is going to be the slow oxidative fibers or our type one. Now the first word in that name there, slow, describes right, the myosin ATPase. That's that enzyme there that is going to break ATP, uh, hydrolyze it into ADP and an inorganic phosphate. So this um, fiber type contains the slow variant of ATPase. So we'll see with slow oxidative fibers, the contractions are going to be slower, yes, and less powerful. But here's the thing, right? These muscle fiber types are wonderful for high endurance, sustained contractions, because our ATP comes from aerobic respiration, the use of the mitochondria there. We can generate a lot of ATP. Right, so this type of muscle fiber is going to have a rich red color, and that's because of all the myoglobin that's found inside the cell, right? And that's going to be the protein molecule that is going to bind to oxygen. And so this type of muscle fiber, we're going to see longer periods of contraction, all right? Which is great, you know, if you're going to be standing for a long period of time or sitting upright for a long period of time, your back muscles are going to be heavily laden with this type of skeletal muscle fiber. Our next type of muscle fiber are the fast oxidative fibers, known as the type 2A or intermediate. Okay, fast, again, refers to the fast variant of the ATPase. Now, these muscle fiber types are going to have fast, powerful contractions, great for explosive maneuvers like sprinting 100 meters when you're first down there in that starting position and you explode out of the gate, all right? I can't remember what they call those contraptions that they put their feet up against, but when you explode out of that, right, you are going to be utilizing primarily the fast oxidative fibers, right? So these will also undergo aerobic respiration, right? But we won't see, right, as much oxygen delivery Unfortunately, because of our myoglobin is going to be less uh, uh, numerous in, the, in this type of fiber type here. And then finally, our last is gonna be the fast glycolytic fibers, all right, our type 2B, otherwise known as fast anaerobic. Again, fast because we're referring to the fast variant of ATPase. Again, we will see with these fiber types, contractions are fast and powerful. Right. These fiber types are the most prevalent, so these types of contractions will be brief. It won't last very long, but important to understand, we get our ATP primarily through anaerobic respiration means. Right. For example, like glycolysis is an anaerobic respiratory means for uh, uh, getting ATP. So while these are the most prevalent, these muscle fiber types will have a white appearance because we don't have myoglobin, don't need it, okay, because we are going to uh, undergo anaerobic respiration, and we don't have mitochondria, all right, again, really don't need it because there's no oxygen for their metabolism here. So when we're actually looking at these fiber types here, right, a single muscle can have all three of these, right? It's not just one muscle is going to contain, right? One type of fiber type, right? So you can see a nice mixture here and it does depend on, all right, the muscle groups here. So the examples that we were showing, you heard me mention before with the back muscles there, right? our back muscles, a lot of what they do has to do with postural support. So that means those muscles have to maintain a sustained contraction for a long period of time. So we'll find a large amount of slow oxidative fibers in our back muscles. Whereas in our hand muscles, we're going to see the fast glycolytic fibers 
all right, predominantly, okay, because of the quick, fast uh, uh, contractions that occur in your hand muscles. Now, this doesn't mean that what you're born with is pretty much what you're going to be stuck with the remaining portion of your life. Now, genetics, all right, will be the primary determinant, all right, of your muscle fiber types, but you can tweak that, okay, you can tweak that through training. So we'll see in long distance runners, right, they will have a larger amount of the slow oxidative fibers in their legs, right, because they need to sustain, all right, when they're doing like a marathon, for example, a 10K, half marathon, whatever, right, they need to have a large amount of ATP producing fiber types, whereas sprinters, they're going to have the fast explosion type of, of, of uh, activity, right? Running right out of the gate there. So we're going to see a higher amount of the fast glycolytic fiber types. Not a lot of ATP on hand because we don't have a mitochondria or myoglobin, right? But we just need to get maybe a hundred yard uh, a sprint going on or a hundred meter dash going uh, down the, the uh, straightaway of the uh, track there. And so they're going to burn through that ATP relatively quickly, right, through that anaerobic respiration there. So here you can see, right, where we're looking at a muscle fiber here, okay, a uh, muscle cell, excuse me, and we have looked at and dissected, and you can see all the different fiber types within the same muscle itself in this muscle fascicle here. All right, we'll see the slow oxidative, the fast glycolytic, right? And then you'll also see the fast oxidative fiber types. You can see the colors. Now, obviously, the fast glycolytic are going to be the lightest staining ones on there. The dark staining ones are going to be the slow oxidative. And then kind of like the pale ones that are kind of in between, that'll be the fast glycolytic then. So which muscle fiber type primarily composes muscles that maintain posture? The slow oxidative. Remember, slow contractions, but sustained long periods of contraction will be the slow oxidative fibers. So this brings me into talking about what a motor unit is. We've talked briefly about it. So now we're gonna to start to combine some of the concepts from chapter 12 from the nervous system here into chapter 10. So what a motor unit is, it's going to be one single motor neuron, like you can see here in this picture and all of the muscle fibers that it controls. So again, one single motor neuron in the various muscle fibers that it can control. And that can vary. You can have one motor neuron innervating one muscle fiber, or you can have one motor neuron innervating 100 muscle fibers, right? But that's what a motor unit is. Don't confuse that. It's always gonna be one single motor neuron and then the number of muscle fibers that it controls can vary. So here's a little bit more of, of a more de uh, uh, descriptive definition here, right? So we know that our motor neuron cells are going to bring motor output signals from the central nervous system, right? That means the brain or the spinal cord, right? Out to the effector organ. In this case, it's gonna be our skeletal muscle. So the axons, are going to travel out of the central nervous system and head out to a specific muscle fiber or group of muscle fibers because our axons can branch, right? It doesn't necessarily have to be one single axon. You can get what we call collaterals and those collaterals branch off of that main axon there. It can go out to various or numerous skeletal muscle fibers. So here is your simplified definition of a motor unit, a single motor neuron and all the fibers that it controls, all the fibers that it controls. So it can vary. And so when we're talking about the size of the motor unit, it really, we're discussing the degree of control of that motor unit. So a smaller motor unit, that is going to be all right, one motor neuron that's going to innervate less than about five muscle fibers. That's going to have higher control, a higher degree of control. Whereas a large motor unit 
can be up to several thousand muscle fibers. And that's going to have a lesser degree of control. So here again, we see another inverse relationship, right? In our ongoing progression through bio 210, we'll see that the size of the motor unit and the degree of control is going to have an inverse relationship. Meaning if you have a small motor unit, you'll have a high degree of control. If you have a large motor unit, you'll have less control or a lower degree of control. Right? So again, we're looking at the muscles, some of those extrinsic muscles of the eye, those will be smaller, smaller motor units. They'll have greater control. Now when we're talking about right, uh, the muscles to your quadriceps there or your hamstrings, those are larger muscle groups, right? we'll see they will have less precise control. Again, here you can see all right, the picture of that neuromuscular junction where that motor neuron is going to innervate the skeletal muscle there. Don't forget, we'll see this neuromuscular junction is going to be normally in the mid region of the muscle fiber. All the parts that are included are going to be the synaptic knob of the motor neuron, and then we'll have the motor end plate, and that will be of the muscle fiber. And then there'll be the space between those two structures, and that's the synaptic cleft, right? All of that is included in our motor uh, unit there. Okay, so I wanted to cover that because to have an understanding about motor units will help you to better understand this next topic that I'm going to discuss, muscle tension. What is muscle tension, all right? Muscle tension is the force that the muscle uh, exerts when it is stimulated to contract. So during contraction, all right, depending if you have a high degree of force or a low degree of force will determine if you have a lot of muscle tension or not a lot of muscle tension. So of course, right, we set up a nice lab experiment and you can see uh, down here below how we've done that. When I was in college, we actually had the opportunity to do this live, right, not with a human muscle, but we actually did it with a frog's muscle. We actually did it with the gastrocnemius and the frog leg. We hung it on a hook, just like you see here. We put a little bit of a weight on the other end. We hooked up these electrodes, and then we were able to stimulate the muscle, that gastrocnemius muscle in the frog, right, by hitting it with a specific amount of voltage at a specific frequency. So two things that are going to stimulate that muscle are going to be the voltage. We'll talk about how both voltage and frequency um, will affect muscle tension and the degrees of muscle tension. So let's start off with a simple muscle twitch, which means we'll have one single stimulus, right? That is going to exert a single muscle contraction. So there's a couple terms up here that you should know when we're discussing a muscle twitch, right? We're going to graph it over time and then it, we'll base it on. Uh, when I say we'll graph it over time, that's going to be our x-axis. Our y-axis is going to be the tension, the amount of force that that muscle generates. So, of course, the stimulus is going to be, all right, the electrical current that we set through that muscle. Then there's a brief period, all right, of delay there, the latent period. I'll talk about what happens, what that period means. But eventually, the muscle will contract. And so we'll start to see a shortening of the muscle. Obviously, that's the contraction period. And then when we stop stimulating the muscle, then our contraction period is always followed by a relaxation period. Right? What goes up must come down. The muscle is going to contract. It's then going to relax. Right? So that is a muscle twitch. So it's a single brief contraction right? followed by relaxation from one single stimulation. And so we've seen in skeletal muscle that we need to, in order to get an action potential to occur, we have to reach a threshold value. So the minimum voltage that we need right, to trigger a twitch is that threshold value that we need to exert on that muscle tissue. All right, so what is that latent period? Well, we stimulate the muscle, okay, but we don't see it contracting right away because of this latent period. Think of all of that information or those steps that we learned about 
in previous classes in regards to, all right, an act potential traveling down, okay, the motor neuron, and then what happens? The neurotransmitter gets released, and then it causes that EPP, that end plate potential, similar to a graded potential, right? But we're trying to trigger the opening of those voltage-gated channels. Once we get those voltage-gated channels to open up, we can initiate an action potential across the sarcolemma. The action potential then disperses across the sarcolemma, travels to the T-tubules, causes the release of calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum into the sarcoplasm. Then it has to move the troponin tropomyosin complex off of those myosin binding sites on the actin. So a lot of that is here in the latent period, all right? Basically, right, what we've done is the voltage is going to initiate that action potential, that stimulation, that release of calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So we have to wait a, a moment for that to occur because it has to diffuse out of the sarcoplasmic reticulum into the sarcoplasm, and then it has to move all right, the regulatory proteins off the binding sites. So we can actually initiate a cross bridge so we can get then our power stroke for a contraction. So that's what we're gonna see here, right? So this is during, all of that is occurring during the latent period. Well, we know what happens during the contraction period. That's our power stroke part, okay? Where the myosin filaments, the thick filaments, pull the thin fil filaments past them. And then of course, when we stop stimulating our muscle, then we're going to see, all right, our tension decrease, right, as that muscle relaxes, and that is based on our connectin, right, that protein there that helps with the elasticity of the muscle. And then, of course, during the relaxation period, our cross bridges, bridges disengage, and calcium gets pumped back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum, and it's moved out of the sarcoplasm. Right, so it takes a little bit of time for this to occur. So that's why we'll see our relaxation period here is longer than the contraction period. So what events are occurring in a muscle that produce the different components of a muscle twitch? And there you can see, all right, our latent period, all the events that lead up to, all right, the contraction period. All right, all the events that lead up to the power stroke, which I just mentioned just a few moments ago, contraction period power strokes, all right? Then the relaxation period, all right? We're gonna return calcium, all right? Back to the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And at the same time, our cross bridges are gonna be released. And then our troponin tropomyosin complex, that conformational change reverts back to its regulatory position. All right, so that's basically a muscle twitch. That, and then again, we measure muscle tension by how much force is generated. So now we're gonna talk about, all right, this next concept called motor unit recruitment, right? Motor unit recruitment, what, we know what a motor unit is. So now we're gonna talk about what happens when we start to stimulate a muscle, right? Several times, repeatedly, right? We can increase the voltage, and as we do that, as we increase our voltage, we're going to start to recruit, all right, more motor units, okay? So there's one thing that you should know, right? If you want to change the stimulus intensity, in this case, as we increase our voltage, that's gonna be our stimulus, we can then recruit more motor units. What does that mean? We can generate more tension, make it more powerful, All right? So another name for this is multiple motor unit summation. Remember the term summation, right? That's when we're going to add things up, okay? Sum is addition, difference is, is subtraction, okay? So here we can see why, All right, certain muscles, right, are going to exhibit varying degrees of force or tension generated. You ever notice, you don't need as many muscles, all right, to pick up a napkin to wipe your face. But if you need to pick up your dog and put your dog in the back of the truck, all right, you're going to use, all right, more 
muscle units there, more motor units to lift up something heavier, okay? So keep that in mind. We're going to have more motor units, all right, depending on what our resistance is going to be. So that means we have to activate more muscle fibers. One way to do that, let's increase our voltage. If we increase our voltage, right, we'll get more motor units involved. Well, at a certain voltage, I have to say, we're gonna involve all the units. So if we keep turning up the voltage past a, a certain level or number, it won't matter because we will have uh, recruited all of the units. So there is, all right, a maximum amount of voltage that we can uh, apply to attain our maximum contraction. So say it's 100 millivolts, for example, okay? Well, and that gets all the motor units. Even if I turn it up to 200 millivolts, I'm gonna get the same result. I'm gonna still recruit the same, all right, number of, of motor units. So keep in mind that we have a maximum amount, all right, of contraction that occur at a specific level or a specific value for voltage. Past that, it doesn't matter. So normally when we recruit all right, our motor units, size does matter. So we will recruit the smallest ones first and the larger ones last. Smaller ones first, larger ones last. So there is an order. We go from smallest to largest. So here, right, you can see an example, right, when we, remember there was two stimuli that we can use for uh, muscle recruitment, for um, um, uh, motor unit recruitment. One is our voltage, right? The other one is going to be the frequency, all right? Our frequency. So you can see here when we're generating a twitch on the left side of our screen, right? If our frequency is about 10, all right, uh, threshold stimuli per 10 seconds, you'll see here, right? We have our period of contraction followed by our period of relaxation. All right, so we are giving our muscles a chance to go from a contraction state to a relaxation state. But now if you go over here to the right side of our screen, you'll notice, all right, now we're gonna to start to increase the frequency, all right, per second. We'll start with 20, so we'll double our frequency. And you'll notice, all right, we've contracted the muscle. All right, now it starts to relax, but then we hit it again with another stimuli, boom. And it starts to contract. And then it starts to level off again and relax. And then we hit it again. As you notice, each of these purple arrows is going to be a stimuli. And you can see how we are, we are stimulating, it, stimulating it, excuse me, more frequently, okay, in between periods. So our frequency is increasing. So at this point, we call this phenomena here, all right, wave summation. Then we'll get into what's called incomplete tetany, where it's close to a sustained muscle contraction, and then there's tetany. And then eventually the muscle will start to fatigue. And we're gonna talk about this. So we're gonna talk about these concepts of wave summation, incomplete tetany and tetany. But I just wanted to show you on this graph here, okay? So we are just starting to increase our frequency of stimulation. And so we're gonna talk about that phenomenon there. All right, so what is wave summation? So if we're going to start, all right, to stimulate, all right, our muscle at about 20, all right, stimuli per second, instead of the 10, we're going to see that our relaxation cannot completely occur before another contraction will result. And as a result of that, we will start to produce higher tension, more force, more force, right? So we, this is one way on how you are able to, for example, you went from picking up a pencil, right? You didn't have to recruit a lot of uh, muscle fibers for that, but then you went to go pick up that heavy suitcase, right? Now the resistance is more, you need to generate more force, right? So we are going to send more frequent stimuli all right, more action potentials to stimulate more muscle fibers. And that's what we'll see here, right? So we're going to upregulate our force, our tension, 
all right, which will create a stronger contraction by those muscles because we're recruiting more muscle fibers. So that leads me into incomplete tetany and tetany. So if we further increase our frequency, right, we will eventually see that incomplete tetany. That's this area right here, that incomplete tetany. Right? And as we do that, we'll see, all right, again, the tension continues to increase, right? Our period of relaxation is almost non-existent, right? So it almost looks like a, a twitching in the muscle because it hasn't been able to completely relax. Right, to almost where these the twitches there will almost be one sustained contraction. So it's not quite just one sustained contraction yet, almost like a twitching. And then eventually, if we increase the uh, uh, frequency even more, up around 50 per second, then we get to tetany. And that is when pretty much it's going to be one straight smooth line on our graph there, right, on our chart. And it's going, to, it's going to look like one sustained contraction. Unfortunately, at these high frequencies, right, we will eventually, uh, the end result will, will, will end up in fatigue right, because we'll burn through all of our energy sources there and then eventually everything ends. <clears throat> so this slide here is showing us, all right, as we increase the intensity, you can see we're increasing our voltage increments here, right? Um, uh, you can see how low the voltage here is in these first couple of twitches here. And if you look down here, you'll notice, all right, we have two red, all right? That means that those are the activated or excited motor units. You'll see they start to increase in number as our voltage increases. So what is this showing us? Well, right, as we increase our voltage, we recruit more motor units here, right? To the point where we get to that, I was talking about this before, where we get to our maximum contractions, we've, we've increased that voltage to a certain level, right? Where it doesn't matter if we keep increasing it, you'll see here, we, we've, we've um, excited our maximal number of motor units. We don't have any more to excite. So, and you'll see here, we keep increasing, all right, the voltage increments, but our muscle tension here is the same because we've reached that maximal value there, right, for all of our motor units with that contraction, with that stimulation there. All right, let's talk about muscle tone. I don't know about you, all right, but for me, you know, one of the easier ways for me to describe muscle tone is basically how relaxed your muscles are, or what we call the resting tension in a muscle. I've heard this all the time from several folks where, and this may have happened when you were in high school or college, you're sitting there in the library, just minding your own business, one of your friends comes over, you know, they put their hands on your back and they're like, hey, how you doing? How's the studying coming? And you're like, oh, I'm just working my, my tail off here. And they start to massage your shoulders, not in a creepy way, okay? And then they're like, wow, you're tight. What they're referring to is your muscle, your, your muscle tone, your resting muscle tone, okay? So what is exactly going on here in all right, when we're discussing muscle tone? Well, basically, right, our motor neurons are going to be stimulating okay, our muscles, but this is going to be an involuntary nervous stimulation, all right, it just happens randomly, boom, 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 the motor unit, all right, the, the motor neurons are just stimulating those muscles, all right, and th they will have this uh, uh, um, tension, right, because they're still generating a force when you're not actively using them, all right, so we call that tension, that resting muscle tone there, so this will occur, all right, all right, until you get fatigue, but you won't get fatigue because this is constantly changing, right? So we're generating some muscle tension, but we're not getting movement, no movement whatsoever. So for example, 
all right, when you're getting a massage and you're laying on the table, right, one, you're not really doing any more weight bearing. So that gives us a pretty good idea of your muscle tone as that massage therapist is working those muscles. But the best way to determine your muscle tone is when you fall asleep, right? Because when you fall asleep, that involuntary nervous stimulation decreases significantly. So since we're talking about muscle tone and muscle tension, we need to talk about the different types of contractions that occur in our bodies. And there's two types. We have our isometric contractions and the isotonic contractions, right? Isometric contractions, we're going to see, right, that the tension gets increased. So, right, that tension becomes increased, right, but the resistance, right, is more than the tension. So that means, for example, if you're going to try to push against the wall, right, or when you see bodybuilders out there on the stage and they're posing, right, and they hold that pose and they're frozen, they're, that, that's an isometric contraction, right? So the muscles are contracting, they're building tension up, right? But the example, when you're pushing on a wall, you can push as hard as you want against that wall, right? And if that wall's not moving, you're not overcoming the resistance, but you're generating increased muscle tension. Here's what happens. The length of the muscle will stay the same. It will stay the same, meaning there's no movement going on. Isotonic contraction is different. Now, when you are contracting a muscle and generating muscle tension, you do generate enough muscle tension to overcome the resistance. All right. So if you go to pick something up and you're moving it, right? Right, you are generating enough muscle tension to cause it to move. So we'll see, right, we've overcome the resistance resulting in movement, All right? So the length is going to change, but here the tone stays constant. So there's two types of isotonic contractions. There's concentric, and that's when the muscle shortens. And an example of that is going to be if, if the biceps brachii, okay? If there's something on the table and you're bringing it towards your mouth, right? You're bending your elbow, right? That is a concentric muscle contraction. Eccentric is when the muscle is actually going to lengthen as it contracts. So when you are taking that drink of whatever it is that you picked up and you put it back onto, all right, the table there, okay? Your biceps brachii is going to lengthen as you bring it back down to the table. That's an eccentric contraction. Right? So when you attempt to shovel a load of snow that is too heavy, what sort of muscle contraction are you doing? Okay, so it's a tough question to ask people down here in the South. All right, but when I was up in New York and I was trying to shovel the driveway, right, as quickly as possible. I didn't want to be out there, but there's a really wet snow. We call it heart attack snow out there because a lot of people get heart attacks. Well, not a lot, but a good number will get heart attacks from shoveling snow, right? But you would dig the, the shovel into the snow. You try to lift it. You could not move that, all right? It's stuck there, right? So when we see this, it's too heavy, right? What usually happens is it's an isometric contraction. We're not able to overcome the resistance, so that's what we're seeing here in this picture of this gentleman, right? Maybe his baby was crying. He goes into the bedroom, okay, and wants to pick the baby up out of the crib. And as he does so, and as he brings the baby up towards his cheek, maybe to snuggle or hug the baby, right? His biceps brachii muscle is going to shorten. So that's a concentric muscle contraction. Then he gets the baby and he holds the baby up to his cheek, like here in the picture on the left, but yet there's no movement going on, right? But he's going to continue to contract that biceps brachii muscle to hold him close, okay? That's an isometric contraction. Now the baby's happy. It's getting sleepy. He wants to go back to sleep. Okay, dad, you've done your job. Let's lay the baby back down in the crib. So he slowly, all right, lowers the baby back down into the crib because it's time for bed. Okay, and that same biceps brachii muscle is now going to contract, but as it's contracting, it's shortening. Oh, excuse me, excuse me, it's lengthening, it's lengthening. All right. 
And so the muscle will lengthen as he's contracting. He's still generating tension, all right? And that muscle force, right, enough to overcome the resistance to lower the baby nice and easy back into the crib. So here's one of our clinical views here. And this is a very good uh, clinical view. Unfortunately, again, we don't have to really worry about it too much in the South, but if you're living somewhere in cold weather, this does apply. So in cold weather, all right, a lot of times too, for folks for that um, engage in um, constant or sustained isometric contractions, we will see an increase in blood pressure. And I'll explain this uh, why here in a moment. So you have to be careful if you're hypertensive, if you have high blood pressure, because if you engage in too many isometric contractions, if you have high blood pressure, right, you can increase it even more and you can put yourself at risk, right, for an aneurysm. That's bad news, especially if you're shoveling snow, because here's what happens, right? You're outside in the cold. We talked about what happens when you're in the cold, right? Your skin, you will get vasoconstriction in the skin that shunts the blood away from the skin and more towards your internal organs. But what that does is that vasoconstriction increases resistance in your cardiovascular circulatory system. When you increase resistance, you increase blood pressure. And so that is going to be a problem, all right, if you already have elevated blood pressure. So now you're increasing your blood pressure because you're in the cold, then you're out there shoveling, right? And under engaging in isometric contractions as you're shoveling snow that you shouldn't be, that's too heavy, that will also increase your blood pressure, putting you at risk, all right? For a bad situation. Okay, let's talk about now length tension relationship. The length tension relationship talks about the length of the muscle at the time that it's stimulated and how much force it can generate. So there's three scenarios here, right? It's like Goldilocks and the three bears, which is just right, right? We always want the Goldilocks effect. We want things to work in our favor. So we have found out that when a muscle fiber is at what we call the resting length, we can generate our maximum contractile force. This is the best. So the resting length of a muscle can generate the maximum contractile force. So for folks that are into physical training, okay, athletes, this is a good way to train. So you should know or have a general idea of what the resting length should be. The reason why we can generate the maximal contraction force is because we have the best or the optimal amount of overlap between the actin and myosin filaments. All right, I'll show you a slide here in a second, but let me talk about the two other scenarios. All right, what happens all right, if the bed is too short for Goldilocks, right, or if we have a shortened length here, it will generate a weaker force. And the reason why is, right, the amount of movement in the sarcomere is significantly limited because, all right, the Z discs have drawn closer together, right? So they go from a distance of this far apart to a distance of this far apart. So we can get more overlap in this distance than we can get in this distance. I'll show you a picture. And then of course, not what happens if the bed is too long, right? Or if we have an extended length, again, we'll generate less force. And that's because, all right, we'll see less overlap in our cross bridges. So pictures are always great. Here's the best one, the resting length. I'll just zoom in a little bit. All right, so you can see with the resting length and on our graph here, we've graphed it, all right? The muscle tension, how much force we can generate compared to the sarcomere length here. That's what we're seeing. So if our sarcomere is too short, look, there's hardly any room here for these Z discs to move any further. 
And that's because we've already gotten a shortened sarcomere when we get it contracted. Conversely, if our sarcomere is lengthened by a lot, look, there's hardly any overlap here between the myosin fibers and the actin fibers. So we need it to be just right. This is what, think, think what would Goldilocks do? Goldilocks would like to have the resting length, right? Where we have a decent amount of overlap here between the thick and thin filaments. This is the optimal amount of overlap. This is too much where we don't have any more room to go. And this is too little, we barely have any overlap. We can hardly form any cross bridges, but here we can form a lot of cross bridges. So that's what we're looking at. Come on now, there we go. All right, so that's our length tension curve. Length matters in this situation. Not too much, not too little, just right in the middle. That's what we like. In which muscle length can a muscle generate the most tension? Contracted, resting length, or stretched? And why? Think of that previous slide that I just showed you. Think of Goldilocks, right? What is the best? That is going to be resting length. Optimal overlap of thick and thin filaments. You'll see this length tension uh, relationship uh, later on, not this semester, but when you get into uh, cardiac physiology. All right, so keep that in mind, very important. Okay, let's talk about the uh, concept of muscle fatigue, getting tired, like when you're studying for several hours, except you're going to be getting tired for a whole different reason. All right, but when we're dealing with muscle fatigue, this is going to be when your muscle is able to generate less force or it produces less tension, right? Primarily, right, the main reason for this is going to be decreased glycogen in the muscle cells. Our glycogen is our stored energy. It's just a bunch of glucose molecules strung together. And so we just start cleaving off the individual glucose molecules, breaking them down into ATP. If there's enough oxygen ready, hoorah! then we can enter into aerobic cellular respiration. If there's no oxygen or very little, then we will be stuck in anaerobic and we'll just stay with the glycolysis here, All right? But the primary reason for muscle fatigue is because we run out of glycogen, All right? That occurs, right, when we're engaging in long periods of activity or exercise. Marathon runners run into this problem all the time, All right? That's the main reason. All right, so what are some of the other reasons? Okay, well, let's start off in the early part of our motor unit at the neuromuscular junction. All right, maybe you don't have enough calcium, all right, that is in the extracellular fluid. If you don't have a lot of calcium, all right, we need calcium to enter into the synaptic knob because it is going to attach itself to the synaptic vesicles and then cause the migration of the vesicles to the plasma membrane. So if you don't have enough to do that, you're gonna have a problem with releasing the neurotransmitter. Then we can't affect our effector organ, all right? Or we can see not enough synaptic vesicles are in our presynaptic neuron, all right? What's in the synaptic vesicles? Our neurotransmitter, acetylcholine. That's the excitatory neurotransmitter. All right, where else can we see problems? All right, excitation contraction, contraction coupling. Right, that is when we are going to generate our act potential, and we're going to cause that act potential to travel along the sarcolemma down the T tubules and cause the release of calcium into the sarcoplasm. So, what could cause an issue here? Well, if you're dehydrated, right, if you do not have enough sodium or potassium, if we can't properly generate an action potential because our ingredients aren't there, if our ions aren't present and pre present in the right proportions, right, then we'll see an issue in trying to generate an action potential. All right, what's another possibility? Calcium again, calcium is big. I told you folks, for uh, muscle contractions, right, you need calcium in ATP, all right? Calcium plays a big, big role here. So of course, all right, if we don't have enough calcium, 
right? Maybe in our diet or throughout our body, we're not going to have enough calcium in the sarcoplasmic reticulum, right? So decreased levels of calcium or in issues with calcium release from the sarcoplasmic reticulum because we need it to remove the troponin tropomyosin complex off of those myosin binding sites on our actin. And then finally, the crossbridge cycling. All right, as you're in an exercising muscle, you're going to break ATP down into ADP and inorganic phosphate. Well, inorganic phosphate can start to accumulate in the cell. And so we have lots of inorganic phosphate and we're not recycling it into ATP, right? What we're going to see is too much inorganic phosphate is going to slow the release of that inorganic phosphate off the myosin head, right? During our cross bridge mechanism. So that will slow down or cause muscle fatigue. And then again, guess what? Here it is again. I told you calcium, 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 right? If we don't have that calcium, right, that is available to move troponin, right? And a lot of the times that calcium can get stuck onto the inorganic phosphate if it's starting to build up, right, to excessive amounts inside the cell. All right, now we get to get into some interesting aspects of the physiology here, all right? We can't not talk about skeletal muscles and not talk about exercise. So let's talk about exercise, all right? What are some of the benefits of exercise, all right? We know it's good for your health, yada, yada, yada. But now we're going to talk about, all right, what happens when you engage in prolonged exercise or sustained exercise. Okay, so when we're dealing with endurance exercise, running, all right, or speed walking, or even walking, right? What we'll see is, right, we need to obviously, if the demand for energy increases, then we need to actually make things, all right, that help to make our energy. And what's that? Uh, mitochondria, the powerhouse of the cell. So in endurance athletes, a lot of their skeletal muscle will have high levels of mitochondria, right? So as the demand increases, right, the cells and the tissues are going to try to meet that demand by upregulating, right, and creating more mitochondria in the cells so we can produce more ATP. Well, what about those people that lift weights, all right, or what we call resistance exercise, right? Well, with that, we primarily will see hypertrophy, all right? Here comes a definition all the way back from chapter five, right? What is hypertrophy? That is an increase in the size of the tissue. In this case, right, we're going to see an increase in the size of the muscle. And the reason why? We're going to make more actin and myosin proteins. So we can have more cross bridges, right? Well, that's great, right? That will help with uh, uh, more uh, 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 energy production, not energy production, more cross bridge so we can get uh, more contractions, right? But we have to um, feed, right, that tissue as it increases inside. So we're going to see increases in mitochondria and the amount of glycogen that we will store inside of the muscle. Now, in some situations, right, in some situations, there's always an exception to the rule, we can see hyperplasia. Hyperplasia is not the same thing as hypertrophy. Hypertrophy is an increase in size, whereas hyperplasia is an increase in the number of cells. In this case, we'll see an increase in the number of muscle fibers, right? But we don't get that as much as we get like with hypertrophy, unless you're taking steroids. All right, so what's the opposite of this, all right? That's all the benefits that we get from exercise. How about if we don't do anything? If we just come home and uh, we play video games all day long, all right? When we lack exercise, we're gonna get atrophy. Now, atrophy is gonna be a decrease in the size and the number, right? But primarily here, we're gonna see it as a decrease in size because we're not using anything. So we usually call that disuse atrophy. So for any of you that have ever injured yourself, okay, and had a cast put on your leg, I broke my leg in a sledding accident um, back in fourth grade. 
Um, I should have learned my lesson because I went down a hill called Suicide Run. That should have been the first thing that uh, jumped into my head, not to do this, but I went down and I hit somebody. They're okay, but I broke my leg. I had to wear a cast for over two months. And when they took it off, right, my calf was about as big as my wrist, right? And that's because I wasn't using those muscles there. Now, in these situations, all right, this, this, these changes all right, initially are reversible. Now, as we get older, right, that can become an issue. But all right, in younger people, it can be reversible. When it doesn't become a, a reversible and it becomes permanent, the reason why is because the muscle tissue converts into connective tissue, fibrotic tissue, okay? Like collagen scar tissue. And because of that, we have less muscle tissue, we'll see less muscle tone. And because there's less muscle tissue, we, can, we will generate less force. All right, so what happens as we get older? Well, usually in the third decade, sometimes the fourth decade of your life, your 30s and 40s, you will start to lose muscle mass. Right? And they, they've said roughly, I've read different sources, but roughly about 10% all right, for every decade. So you'll start to lose 10% of your muscle mass. Now, this is if you did nothing. If you were just a blob and did not have any type of movement. All right? A lot of this is because, all right, we do in general decrease our activity. A lot of us will say, well, yeah, I was, of course, I wasn't as active, all right, um, in my 40s as I was in my, uh, when I was a little kid, when I was six, when I was eight, okay? So what we'll see is, all right, as we lose our muscle mass, and again, it's pretty obvious, as we lose the muscle mass, we become smaller, all right? We are able to generate less force, and even the endurance portion, right? It's harder for us to maintain certain positions for a long period of time, right? So again, keep in mind, the effects of aging, things slow down and we lose stuff, right? I lose my mind every day thinking about this kind of thing, but we will start to see a significant decrease in the number and also the size, right, of that muscle tissue there. And as we start to see things uh, lost, Okay, um, one of the things that we see lost is our ability to store oxygen. That means less myoglobin. Protein production of myoglobin decreases significantly. Our circulation starts to really stink, All right? For those of you that are older, take a look at your legs. You might see an increase in varicose veins, all right? And that's just an example, all right? of when you have valvular insufficiencies in the veins there, but in general, your circulation starts to become worse because one, all right, you lose the elasticity in some of your blood vessels, all right? But also as your activity levels decrease, all right, your need for a very diverse circulatory system becomes less and less, so you might not have as much circulation going on. And because of that decrease in exercise, you're decreasing the demand, all right, for blood flow to those tissues. So we decrease the supply of blood to those tissues there. And of course, like I said, as you get older, right, the activity of certain cells, right, starts to fall off. Well, if you remember at the beginning of this chapter, we talked about the satellite cells. Those are the support cells for the uh, muscle tissue. Right, so we get a decreased number of our support cells, our satellite cells. So the muscle tissue does not have that support system to help it recover from injury or to repair, repair damage. And if we don't have those satellite cells there, what do we do if that tissue becomes damaged? No problem. We're gonna, we're gonna fix it, but we're not gonna fix it right, with the original tissue. Guess what? We're gonna fix it with fibrotic tissue, scar tissue. What is scar tissue? Dense regular connective tissue. And if you recall, right, when we we're learning about dense regular connective tissue and learning about the different characteristics of connective tissue, I'll tell you this right now, flexibility was not one of those characteristics, okay? So what happens with fibrotic tissue invading the muscle tissue? You become less flexible. All right, and of course, right, 
What happens then with all of these things? We add it all together, you get a decline in your muscle performance. You might not be able to run as far right, or walk as far. Right? So what do you need to do? Increase, this is my public service message, increase your physical fitness and do it the whole life. Your whole life, you should be doing that. There you go. That's my, my message to everybody. What is the term for an increase in skeletal muscle fiber size resulting from repetitive stimulation of skeletal muscle fibers? Hypertrophy, size, increase in size. Increase in number, hyperplasia. Increase in number, hyperplasia. All right, so that leads me to anabolic steroids, another clinical view here, all right? We've all heard about steroids, okay? And so there's anabolic steroids and catabolic steroids, all right? Anabolic steroids likes to build things from smaller things to larger things. So anabolic steroids help to build up, okay, muscle tissue, right? So it mimics the effects of testosterone and testosterone is a wonderful um, androgen that helps to build up all right, muscle proteins. So we build up more muscle proteins. What are those? Actin and myosin. And so we start to make more of these contractile proteins and that causes hypertrophy. And in some cases we will get hyperplasia, all right? So this helps to increase muscle mass, these anabolic steroids do. But unfortunately it increases a couple other things. Increases your risk for heart disease and stroke, all right? Kidney damage liver tumors. I mean, here's the thing. I watched this one video. There was a guy that bodybuilder, not a bodybuilder, excuse me, a, a, a competitive weightlifter for bench press. And this guy, unfortunately, got into taking anabolic steroids. And uh, unfortunately, one of the, the side effects was that he developed horrible blood clots in his legs. And he had to have both of his legs amputated above the knee. So you're like, wow, that really, you know, uh, probably hindered him. There goes his dreams of, of, of working out, you know, and winning these competitions. Well, guess what? This guy, because he lost his legs, it allowed him to drop down in a weight class because they base it off how much you weigh. So he lost a significant amount of his body weight and he would still compete. And he kept doing steroids after all of his, both of his legs were taken away. It just blew my mind. Anyways, um, that's one of the things that you really have to be careful with is the blood clots there, right? And in men, we'll see testicular atrophy. Hmm, I wonder why. Well, the reason why is if you're taking in anabolic steroids, your body doesn't need to produce as much testosterone anymore, right? So you get testicular atrophy. In males, we also will develop what's called gynecomastia, which is, right, our breasts start to develop, right? Again, you've heard of this before too, aggressive behavior, right? Increased blood pressure because you're messing around with the kidneys and the kidneys are the number one organ that help to regulate blood pressure and they'll get terrible acne. And then you'll start to see, all right, issues with, uh, facial hair growth, but also in men, the loose hair on the top of their head and thinning. And if women are, are foolish enough, like men, to take anabolic steroids, then we'll see, all right, their menstrual cycles will become um, disrupted. I strongly discourage people from using anabolic steroids, strongly. So what are some of the changes in skeletal muscle accompanying aging? There you go, all right? So decreased muscle mass, right? Because we're losing our muscle fiber number and the diameter, they just start to shrink down, right? Less oxygen, right? Because of the less myoglobin there, right? So we'll lose muscle strength and endurance, right? Our blood circulation starts to decrease over time, right? And so there's a whole list. We start to have uh, fibrosis occurring when the muscles get damaged. So you lose elasticity. It's not fun, unfortunately, getting old. But here's the thing, okay? A lot of these effects, all right, can be slowed even more just by exercise all throughout your life. And I'm not saying you need to be a runner. I'm not saying you have to be a weightlifter. Walking is just fine, all right? 
Just get out there and move. Motion is life. Motion is life. Never stop moving. Just when you thought we were done, right, with the muscles. Remember, that was just skeletal muscle that we've been talking about this whole time, okay? We have to talk about the other two muscle types that um, we have in our body, cardiac and smooth. Now, I promise you there's not a lot that I'm going to be discussing because, right, in bio 211, you'll talk about these muscle types in much more detail, okay? So cardiac muscle cells, and we've talked about this. Remember, our skeletal muscle cells were one long cylindrical multinucleated cell, right? Cardiac muscle cells are going to be much shorter. They do branch and they can have one to two nuclei. They have striations, all right, like skeletal muscle. So that means that they have sarcomeres. Now, these muscle uh, cells are loaded with mitochondria. Well, that makes sense because your heart is 7-Eleven. It's 24-7. It's going all of the time. Right, so and it needs to generate lots of ATP. So it needs lots of oxygen. And if it's got lots of oxygen, then it's got plenty of mitochondria so we can engage in that cellular aerobic respiration there. You remember the intercalated discs, right? We talked about those. Those were the, um, when we're looking at the um, tissue slides there for cardiac muscle cells, you'll see these dark lines there. And intercalated discs are made up of two structures, desmosomes and gap junctions, right? And so they're found in between our cardiac muscle cells. And these intercalated discs, one, allow for the contraction of the cardiac muscle cells to be much more efficient and effective, but also, right, they allow, especially those gap junctions, for the flow of ions from one cell to the next. And so it allows for the electrical currents all right, of the of, of cardiac muscle cells to experience less resistance. So when depolarization occurs, it's able to kind of wash across those cardiac muscle cells with much more ease. You'll get more on that in chapter 19. So you're not, well, I'm not going to get into that. All right, we do have a specialized cell, all right, that's in our cardiac muscle tissue, right, and those are our pacemaker cells. And these cells are what we call autorhythmic which means they'll depolarize, all right, spontaneously. And so they'll stimulate the cardiac muscle cells to contract, right? So I always think of what better movie than Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom when there was this guy, the bad guy, or one of the bad guys in the movie, right? He was this priest that was able to reach his hand into people's hearts, into their chest and pull out their heart and their heart would still be beating. And so I used to think that can't be real. It's not in your body, but guess what? It is real, okay, right? These autorhythmic pacemaker cells will depolarize, right? And they will cause the heart to contract when it stimulates those cardiac muscle cells. But keep in mind, all right, when we are talking about the heart, all right, that's where you find cardiac muscle cells is in the myocardium, right? The autonomic nervous system controls your heart, right? And it controls a lot of other systems in the body. And we'll talk about that later on in chapter 15, right? But the autonomic nervous system will control your heart rate, how fast or how slow it goes, and the force of contraction. So two things, heart rate, how fast or slow, and the force, right? Is it really hard or is it just hard, all right? How hard these muscles will contract. All right, so we've seen this picture before, the nice branching cardiac muscle cells there, striated because there are sarcomeres involved. You can see the gap junctions in the desmosomes that are found in between the cardiac muscle cells there. So what are some of the differences between skeletal muscle and cardiac muscle? Here you go, All right? So I've talked about it. I won't repeat that, but I'll give you a quick moment just to take a glance at that. You can always pause this video and copy this down, but you should definitely know right, the differences between skeletal muscle and cardiac muscle. Okay, last but not least, smooth muscle, smooth muscle. We call it smooth muscle because there are no striations in smooth muscle. Smooth muscle is found all over your body, all over. And unfortunately, I don't get enough time to talk about it here because Smooth muscle is going to be covered a lot 
and a lot of the other organ systems of your body. So for example, in our circulatory system, blood vessels, right? Smooth muscle is found in the blood vessels. And so when it contracts, it causes vasoconstriction. When it relaxes, it causes uh, vasodilation. And so that is going to help, right? Regulate not just blood pressure, but also the flow of blood. In the respiratory system, we find it in the bronchioles, same thing. When they contract, it causes bronchoconstriction and narrowing of the lumen. And when they relax, it causes bronchodilation. And that's when we get a, a, an opening of the lumen here. And that will allow us to control the amount of flow of air to the alveoli. Digestive system, it does a wonderful job by mixing up the stuff that you've ingested. And then also it helps to move it along the digestive system from the proximal portion more to the distal portion during the digestive process there. Urinary system, right? How do we get urine out of our body from the kidneys to the bladder, right? We'll find it in the ureters there. Female reproductive system, right? In our um, uterus there, okay? Again, we'll see the function of smooth muscle. You'll talk much more about that later on. So this slide here just shows you all the various places here that you can see where smooth muscle is located, all these different uh, systems throughout the body. All right, so let's quickly just talk about all right, the anatomy, the microscopic anatomy of a smooth muscle cell. All right, smooth muscle cell reminds me of a football. So they call it fusiform in shape, kind of like this. It's tapered ends, right? Kind of similar to a fibroblast, right? But this configuration allows us to pack these muscle cells closely to one another. Now, the nice thing about smooth muscle cells is, is they have only have one nucleus and it's right in the middle there, okay? Right in the middle. Now, the plasma membrane, the sarcolemma, right, will have, right, calcium gated channels, right, on the surface. And we'll talk about that here in a moment, but they don't have, and this is important, they don't have T tubules. Those are absent. So no T tubules are going to be found here in our um, smooth muscle cells. They have something different. We call those calveoli, all right? And they're like, I know the description there says like a flask, flask-like invagination, but it's more of like a gradual kind of thing like this. And I'm not even doing it justice, okay? So that's the, the, the uh, calveoli, or calveoli, excuse me. All right. And then of course, right, we do have a sarcoplasmic reticulum, we just don't have a lot of it. So again, remember in our skeletal muscle tissue, we saw that a good place for us to store calcium was in the sarcoplasmic reticulum, along with two of our protein storing, protein storing, cal, protein, calcium, protein storing structures, right? We had calsequestrin and calmodulin. And those were two proteins that would store calcium. They'd, they'd bond to calcium. And then when it was time to, uh, if we needed the calcium, they'd release the calcium there, right? But unfortunately, we don't have a lot of, a, sar of, a lot of sarcoplasmic reticulum available. So where do we get our calcium? Outside the cell, outside the cell. So what's gonna help with that? What's gonna help us get that calcium, all right, outside the cell? These fellas, all right, those calcium channels. That's why we got them. All right, so here you can see all right, our smooth muscle cell and they're nice. You see that fusiform configuration, how they're kind of packed into one another. Now, a couple of things that I should draw to your attention here. All right, we have these structures called dense plaques, and these structures called dense bodies. And you'll have these dense plaques on the outside of the cell. But what attaches to the dense plaques are these structures here called the intermediate filaments. All right, so they're just proteins, all right, relatively strong. And they, 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 they attach onto these dense plaques, which are located all right, onto the sarcolemma along the plasma membrane here. So here you're looking at two, okay, smooth muscle cells relaxed. But this is how we, again, we don't have, um, 
We don't have um, sarcolemmas, okay? No, wait, hold on, give me a second here. My brain's not working this afternoon and I'm almost done. Sarcomeres, excuse me. We don't have sarcomeres, so we don't have those striations there. But what we do have are these structures here where we have our thick filaments and our thin filaments, so the actin and the myosin. But we'll see, all right, how our thin filaments, instead of being anchored to a, a Z-line, they're anchored to these dense bodies. And some of these dense bodies will have the intermediate filaments. So here's our relaxed, smooth muscle cells. And here's this triangular shape configuration here between our thick and thin filaments in a relaxed muscle cell. We'll take, now take a look. Here is a contracted smooth muscle cell. Everything is getting pulled from within the inside here. And if you notice, look at this space here now. This little triangular area here compared to this triangular area here. So as we start to get the cross bridging and all that, right, you'll see, okay, these dense bodies get pulled towards each other, which makes this triangle area here smaller. But attached to these dense bodies are these intermediate filaments that attach onto the plaques. So they kind of pull everything inwards. And so that's what we see during a contracted smooth muscle cell contraction. So keep that in mind. And those intermediate filaments we talked about back in chapter four, right? Those were some of our cytoskeleton components. Remember microtubules, right? Intermediate filaments and whatnot, right? So those, that, those components, those cytoskeleton components will attach onto dense bodies and dense plaques. So when our myosin and our actin, when they start to cross bridge and start to slide past one another, or when we start to um, pull the uh, actin past the myosin, we're gonna pull the dense bodies close to one another. And so when we do that, right, those dense bodies will pull on the intermediate filaments, which will pull the plaques inwards there. And so it basically makes everything smaller, right? So we're gonna, create a kind of a twisting motion here, a twisting motion. All right, so let's, let me explain to you how this all works. And to be honest with you, smooth muscle contraction is a lot easier to understand than skeletal muscle contraction, okay? So when we're dealing with comparing skeletal muscle and smooth muscle, we're still gonna have actin, we're gonna have myosin, and we're also gonna have tropomyosin. We just don't have troponin, okay? So we don't have to deal with, all right, that regulatory protein situation there. So in this situation, all right, we are going to be able, this is one of the things that we, um, that is interesting about smooth muscle, all right? Those myofilaments on the inside, we're going to see along the entirety of the thick filaments we'll have myosin heads, this is important, along the entire length. In skeletal muscle, we didn't have that. So big deal, what's that mean? Well, we can make more cross bridges. We can have more cross bridges, which is advantageous to us, right? Because smooth muscle might have to contract for a while. So that brings me to this phenomenon here called the latch bridge mechanism. It's really, really kind of cool. So he, it's kind of like where we get these cross bridges occurring, okay? And they kind of lock in place. And the nice thing about it is, right, when we get that myosin, all right, connecting to the actin, all right, they can stay there for a long period of time. Here's the best part. It doesn't use extra ATP. We're not burning through our energy stores. Well, that's great. That is wonderful. It's very advantageous for smooth muscle. All right, so how do we get this to occur? And I'm gonna show you a nice uh, slide here, it kind of flows through, but I need to mention, all right, three things. One, calmodulin, I mentioned that earlier, that is one of the proteins that binds onto calcium. We saw it in the sarcoplasmic reticulum ter terminal cisterna of skeletal muscle, all right? But we're gonna see it here, all right, inside of the smooth muscle cell. And so we need, all right, calcium 
to bind onto the cow modulin because it's going to cause it to change shape. And I'll get into that in a moment. And that's what's going to help us to trigger a contraction. All right. So we have two enzymes that I need to talk about. The first one is myosin light chain kinase. Hmm. Kinase. What's a kinase? Oh, I know what a kinase is. A kinase is an enzyme that likes to stick phosphate onto stuff. We call that phosphorylization. So this MLCK, the myosin light chain kinase, is going to phosphorylate all right, the myosin all right, once it gets activated by the calmodulin. And I'll show you again. I'll get into this in a moment. The other all right, enzyme is the myosin light chain phosphatase, okay? Well, this one here, phosphatase, right? This enzyme is going to dephosphorylate. It's going to take that phosphate off the myosin head. And so when that occurs, we get relaxation. All right, so let's just look at pictures. I'm just, all that is to get in the picture. We'll go nice step-by-step -step process. And a lot of this you'll be amazed by because you'll be like, oh, I know that. That makes sense. All right, so let's start off with the first part. All right, so we're gonna start this process, all right, for the contraction. In order to do that, we need calcium. Again, this is another reason why calcium is so important in our physiology, all right? So in our sarcolemma here, <clears throat> on the smooth muscle, in the calveoli, you can see that these are those depressions, those flask-like depressions. We're going to find these voltage-gated calcium uh, ion channels. So they will be triggered to open up. How? By what else do we know of? An action potential, okay? An action potential will trigger, again, voltage-gated means we need a change in the uh, membrane potential there. So the action potential will trigger the opening of these voltage-gated calcium channels and of course, we don't have a lot of calcium inside the cell, but we got a ton outside. So calcium will flow into the inside the cell. And it's going to look for that calmodulin, that calcium binding protein. When it does that, it binds onto it and it causes it to undergo a conformational state change. And in the picture here, we just it looks like we're just bending it. But regardless, what happens is we now have caused it to change shape and therefore we have activated this, end, this um, protein here. And so it's going to go and seek out right, our myosin light chain kinase. So the calmodulin stimulates right, the myosin light chain kinase and it activates it. And so this enzyme doing what all right, kinase enzymes do, it is going to go and phosphorylate something. So what's it going to do? it's going to phosphorylate the myosin head. And by doing that, okay, that will then start to begin that process of our cross bridge formation. So we phosphorylated, all right, the myosin head, all right, and we've activated myosin. What's the next step? Cross bridge. Now that that, that myosin head has been activated, it will then, all right, bind to the actin, form the cross bridge, and we'll get the power stroke, all right? While that occurs, you know what happens during the power stroke, ATP becomes hydrolyzed and broken down into ADP and the inorganic phosphate, all right? So as this occurs, all right, remember those uh, intermediate filaments there are going to be pulled on, all right? And they anchor onto right, those proteins in the sarcolemma. And so it causes the contraction and the kind of the pulling in. And you can see it here. We pull in those dense plaques located in the sarcolemma. And it pulls everything, and that causes the, mus the muscle cell to contract. Right? So then, of course, the next part is we are going to get the activation all right, of further cross bridges, and we can get that, um, zoom back out, we can get that latch bridge mechanism, which leads me to, folks, the final slide here, okay, the final slide, all right, 
But one of the reasons why we consider smooth muscle cells to be fatigue resistant is because of that latch bridge mechanism, right? We don't require a lot of ATP, right, for these muscle cells to contract, right? These muscle cells can maintain their contraction because of that latch bridge mechanism there until we dephosphorylate the myosin head. When we do that, phosphate then, all right, will disengage from the myosin head, and then we can disengage our cross bridge there. All right, so this is one of the reasons why, all right, smooth muscle is, again, very advantageous to a lot of the various organ systems in our body. Think about the, our digestive tract, for example, all right? What happens in our small intestine? We are going to be propelling food throughout the small intestine, but also mixing it. And so this, all right, allows us not to use, all right, exorbitant amounts of ATP. So we can have, all right, contractions over a long period of time without fatigue. And so that's, it's just, it's, it's a wonderful, wonderful um, um, physiological advantage that uh, smooth muscle does have. All right. And then finally, of course, all right, smooth muscle like cardiac muscle is going to be stimulated by the autonomic nervous system, all right? So it is going to be involuntary. Cardiac, excuse me, skeletal muscle is innervated by the somatic nervous system and therefore it is voluntary. All right, folks, I hope you enjoyed that. That is the end here of muscle. I know it's a lot to take in. Um, enjoy the video and have a great day.